these things, cycloids, they're absolutely brilliant. I mean, they give excellent gear ratios and a very compact mechanism. They're able to transmit torque well, they're very hard wearing, and they're stunningly easy to make. I mean, we've made these by 3D printing, we've made them by laser cutting, I've handmade them, we've made them in wood, we've made them in plastic. It's just a huge range of materials and a huge range of ways you can actually make a compact gear set that can be used in a machine very efficiently. But the problem is, what do you do if you don't want this particular gear ratio? I mean, this one is 11 to 1. I know it's 11 to 1 because it's got 11 bumps on it, and that's how you know what a gear ratio for a cycloid is. But what about if you don't want that? How do you actually draw it? How do you go around creating your own cycloid for the gear ratio that you want? Now, I have heard it said that you really need a computer program to do that, but to be honest, you don't at all. What really helps is to have a think about what it is you're actually doing. Now, if we take a couple of circles, and this might seem really stupid, but it's also something people forget. When we take a couple of circles, if I rotate that circle so that the movement from here on the edge is one centimetre, it'll push against that circle. That circle will also move one centimetre. Why? Because it's two surfaces pushing against each other, so they're going to move the same distance. And that's what's important about gears. It's actually the distance that it moves. If this is very small, say it was uh, one centimetre all the way around, and this was 100 centimetres all the way around, one turn of this will travel 100 centimetres. What that means is that this has to travel 100 centimetres. Because it's one centimetre, it's going to have to turn 100 times. And that's where gear ratios come from. Gear ratios are really an approximation when it's done by teeth because teeth is a fixed step size, and it does help to have an approximation like that, but it's actually all about the distance that's being moved and nothing to do with the number of teeth. The number of teeth is just an approximation. It's all about distance, and this seems to be something that we kind of forget, because the distance from the edge of that circle as it moves transfers into other movement. So if your car travels a mile, the distance around the wheel has gone a mile. It must do because they're rubbing against the road and this must do because it's rubbing against that. The only other problem here of course is you do get slip and gears prevent slip. The gear ratios and pulley ratios are exactly the same because it's distance moved. Now I said that may seem trivial but actually it's kind of important. So here we are in Tinkercad, and that's my big disc, 100 by 100, that I'm going to turn into my cycloid. Now, cycloids obviously work by eccentric cams, and to create an eccentric cam, we've got one there at 20 by 20, and one there at 26 by 26, and then right there, I've got something at 8 by 8, where I'm going to put my axle. Tinkercad has a few sort of odd little bits and pieces about it that mean it's, um, well, Sometimes a pain and sometimes a benefit. In this case, it's a benefit. So if I line those two up, like that, so the what's going to become our eccentric is touching the edge of the larger circle, and then I line up the larger circle with the hole, but I center it to the larger circle, it's eccentric to the smaller circle, and if I group those, we have our cam. So that's going to become our cam, that's going to become our cycloid. So what I've done is drawn this big blue circle and positioned it central to the orange circle, and I've put the cam so it's right on the edge of the orange circle. The blue circle represents the path of the larger disk that we drew. As that larger disc rotates, of course it won't move from the blue circle because the center of rotation is in the center of the disc. But of course this cam here will start to bash into the orange bit. And what we need to do is carve out a path of that orange bit to allow that cam to move. So the question is, of course, how do you do that? Well, let's say we want 10 teeth on our cycloid. And the reason for 10? It's easy to do the math. If you can't divide 360 by 10 in your head, then you shouldn't be allowed out in public with money. If I have a full circle at 360 degrees, and I want to move one-tenth of that circle 
I need to move 36 degrees. What we need to do is make sure that the cam rotates one full rotation for every 36 degrees of the go around the big circle. What that will do is create a path. And the length of that path, or the distance moved, needs to be equal to the distance around the cam that we've just made. Okay, hopefully that's clear, because this is how we do it. So to do this, first of all, copy that. Then rotate that by 180 degrees. Why 180 degrees? Because we're going from bottom dead centre to top dead centre. Then click on the one you just rotated, shift and click on the big blue disc, and then rotate that 18 degrees. You rotate that 18 degrees because it's half of 36, and of course we're just moving half the distance because we're going from top dead centre to bottom dead centre. And zoom in on here, you can see that the cam is now eaten into the big orange disc. So here it's sitting at, let's call that top dead centre, right on the edge. 180 degrees is at bottom dead centre. We can repeat that now to take out this small section here. We only rotate that 9 degrees. And this one, we only rotate 90 degrees because it's halfway. And again, if we zoom in on that, we can see we've taken another chunk out and that path is beginning to be followed. Now to carve that out, all we do is make these holes and merge it. You can see that we've got these little chips here. We repeat that process but this time at 45 degrees and four and a half degrees and so on, taking out those chips until we form a nice smooth line. So basically, if you take about half a degree rotation of the big disc and four and a half rotations of the little disc, you'll more or less get 40 little chips out of it. And 40 little chips is enough to approximate a smooth line when it comes to printing or cutting it. What it equates to is something like 1,800 little chips all around the circle. And you repeat that process. Now, you can do it manually, but that'd be pretty tedious for 1,800 chips. But you don't need to do that. Because everything is a mirror or a duplication when it comes to these kind of things. You only really need to do one half of a tooth. Then you can mirror it and then join it to create the whole tooth and mirror, copy that and go around the circle to create the whole disc. So you only really need to do it about 40 times. But equally, 40 times is a little bit tedious. And luckily, Tinkercad comes with something called code blocks. So here I am on the home screen and you'll see code blocks right here. We've got 3D circuits and then code blocks. Just click on code blocks and it will pull up code blocks. And we have an option here of either opening one we're already working on or opening a new one by typing in the name of it and create. And it will create a code block project for you. When it opens up the screen, this is what it looks like. Now on the left hand side here, you've got all of the stuff that you're able to do and it's grouped into shapes, modify, control, math, variables and then stuff that's left over from older versions that's still incredibly useful. What you're doing in code blocks is essentially coding for it to do what you would normally do on the screen. So say you want a cylinder. If I pull on that cylinder shape, then I can open that up and it will give me the, sh the cylinder parameters. So here the radius is 10, so it will create a cylinder of 20, of height of 20, with sides 20. We can change that to 64, which is the maximum. Now if I run it by stepping through it here, what it will do is in this display screen, show me the shape I just created. We would do that normally in Tinkercad by going to the shapes menu and pulling it onto the work plane. Here we can code it 
to be able to pull it onto the work plane for us. And this is really important, particularly when it comes to doing something tedious, because I can modify and build the different shapes in here by adding code to it. So let's put a cylinder in there, a square in there as well. And if we add a square in there, reload this, we'll change that square to height 10. Now I can step through and it will add the cylinder and add the square and it adds them sequentially as it goes down this list. What I could then do was change that uh, square into a hole, reload it, I've changed the command, step through, cylinder, square with a, that is a hole. But I can modify this by picking a modifier. So let's group that. And again, click it on there, just like Lego. Clear this so that we can step through it again. It will begin by loading the cylinder, loading the square hole, and now it will group them and we get well, exactly what we would get, and we can look at it in the same way, exactly what we get on the work plane. The single exception is it places the position of the object halfway through the plane. And normally when you drag it in, I think again it places on top of the plane. But all you're doing is Lego building these things where it performs an action one after the other. And of course that's extremely useful if we want to do something 40 times because we have this. We can repeat that by clicking that, adding it, and then everything in this will get repeated once or whatever I happen to type in there. So if I type in 10 there, it will go through these two 10 times performing that action, which is of course exactly what we want to do, because we want to do a repeated action 40 times. Now I strongly recommend you have a look at code blocks because it is, like Lego, it's pretty easy to use, but immensely powerful for doing repetitive jobs. And here's the code that I wrote in order to be able to do what we're trying to do. And you can see from here, it goes through these steps 40 times. Okay, let's run that and see what it actually does. Of course, what I can do then is export that half a tooth from code blocks and re-import it as an STL into a normal Tinkercad page. And here is what I produced in code blocks. Now, if I click on that, duplicate it, mirror it, I can use the workspace. Drop that on there with D, and then merge it so we get a single tooth. Now I can copy that tooth and rotate it around 36 degrees and create me the whole cycloid. So that I get that. That's now actually ready to print, so I can export that as an STL, and then I can print it off. And once I've printed it off, that's what I get. And the eccentric will turn and follow that path that we've just created. And as it turns, then it turns the right distance because we made it that way. So that the length of this path between top to top is the same as one full rotation of that eccentric. So that's how you create cycloids along with their eccentric to drive them. The distance around the eccentric is created by making that path the same length of the dis distance by chiseling little bits out. You can do that with a, a pen and paper, you can do that with Tinkercad as you've just seen me do it, or you can do it with a more complex program, it doesn't really matter. All you're doing is making sure that the distance around that is the same as the distance of that path by chiseling bits out. Anyway, that's how you go about making cycloids. I hope it was of interest. I understand it was a bit of a whistle stop, 
but the essence is there so that if you want to replicate this, well, just create a few circles and chisel them out or get to grips with code blocks because it's there. It is only a macro, so it's quite easy to learn and it starts getting you thinking in the way of producing macros and later in the way of handling more complex programs. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it helped. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.